Hello, my name is Jim Porter. I am a co-manager, operations manager here at the University of Science and Philosophy. I've been a student for 46 years. I remain a student and will until I leave the planet. The Russells uh, will talk about in depth uh, to the best of my ability. You'll notice I've got a lot of props here. I like to show things in three dimension. So be patient with me as I do that. We, the university is located at 518 West Main Street, Waynesboro, Virginia. Uh, we've been now back in, uh, in a museum form uh, within our building for about three years. Uh, and in the process uh, of getting here, uh, a great deal of love and work went into it. So for those people that have shown up and those people online, please take a moment to look us up online at philosophy.org and see who we are. What I'm going to be covering today is a, a statement uh, of my understanding. Please get that down. My understanding of universal law, natural science, and living philosophy. The Russells make it very clear that it's a personal journey, but the journey is yours, and they would be the first ones to tell you, don't limit yourself to what you think I might know. You're shorting yourself. Do this. In our home study course, the first two units are on meditation and prayer. There's your connection with source. If you own it, read it over and over again. These are the first two of 12 units from the home study course. This is your key to discovering your divinity. It's not someone like me outside of yourself, although with my limited ability, today I will try and point the way. This is knowing. Once you get it within your being as a reality, I am simply sound, body, expressing what I can share with you. So I'm going to start off with the slideshow to get myself focused. Nothing that we, you see here or nothing that you discover on our site, nothing that you would uh, um, be able to enjoy when you come to the university itself would be here without the Russells. They are a unique couple in my world. There's been illuminates prior to them, and there's been geniuses and there's been mystics. But these two illumined beings, it's something that I've never witnessed anywhere else in history. They met and they married. That's huge. There's no other time that any such mating is recorded. They are the, pardon me, the personification of love, the personification of what they teach. They are the living embodiment of that which is divided, but by being united in love, they became light multiplied to a degree. I always re refer to it, it's as if a boulder was dropped into a pond, not a pebble. This message will reverberate throughout the next three to six or longer thousand years. And it is just that. It's a message by two illumined beings to make you aware of the divine source from which you come. There's no greater gift to me. So let me get going here. There we go. I'm going to uh, uh, quote mostly from the Russells. Uh, because they're the ones that uh, gave us this. Now, this particular uh, quote is from the Universal One. And I want to start out here because the largest hurdle I found to get over when I first came to this teaching is they're telling me that the divine and I were one. I know someone previous to them did. But all I heard growing up was he was one with the divine. I didn't hear we all were. We all are. So let's go up here and, and give it a shot. This is from the Universal One, three or four pages in. I've always liked it. It's one of the first of their books that I read. A man's concept of the sublime being as, a, as the creator of a material universe, different, and, different in substance from spiritual universe, is a misconception. God is all there is. 
Beyond God, there is nothing. Superior to God, there is nothing. Inferior to God, there is nothing. Opposed to God, there is nothing. If this indeed is the truth, then who are you? You, an individual being embodied, discovering your divinity. And you have as long as it takes to do that. And you have it from source without judgment, without punishment. The only discomfort you will feel in that journey are those that we bring upon ourselves. And I mean you, the individual, and us in the collective as humanity. These discomforts, those things we call good and bad, are brought our way by us. I literally remember one day uh, many years ago when I was struggling with my destiny. And I was overwhelmed by the shortcomings of my ability to care for my family. And I went out and I stood before God and I shook my fist and I said loudly, how can you let this happen? And the answer instantly came into my soul. I didn't. You did. It changed my thought patterns right there and then. I'm master of my own destiny. And my divine center will give me all the power in the universe to manifest that destiny. But as Leo says in her book, God will work with you, but not for you. You're master of that destiny. All the rest is already done. You just have to walk the path. Beautiful book, by the way. Oh, I want to point this out. I'll probably use it a couple of times. In the science, they're talking about the way. Look at nature. This is all it's ever doing. Winding in, winding out, expressing the wave. Body. All right, let's move on here. But consider that, please. Uh, in your meditations, these are the things that, that I find work for me. If I... If, well, more than that, in my meditations and in my day, I find that if I go forth in my meditate or if I decentrate in my meditations to know my divinity, I am given everything I ask. And when I'm awake, trying to manifest that divinity, I'm responsible to do it. Me. Oh, sorry, me. <laughs> we all are. And we also have, have a responsibility in, in defining that God as us to the degree that we're able. Um, I don't know personally. I, I have a very hard time conceiving the entirety of universality. Uh, it's just embodied. It's an immense thought for me. Immense. Um, I can say uh, briefly that I had an experience of dying when I was five. I drowned. And I was instantly out of body and in absolute. There's not work. Eternal love and light. They were the same thing. Yet I was still me. Now I realized as I got older, I was probably still me recognizing the state that I was in as a universal me, but still me, not the universal one. I was still attached to body. Whatever that golden thread is, I was still attached to body while they were trying to resuscitate me from drowning. And then I'm back in body with all the joys and discomfort that go with it. But that short momentary experience, it changed me profoundly. From that moment on, the rest of my life, nobody could convince me you couldn't do it with torture. You might make me say it, but you won't convince me that I and the Father are not one. It's there, but, and it's inside every one of us. We just have to know that or choose not to. <laughs> That's okay, too. <laughs> You'll work your way around to it. You will. Let's jump up here a little bit. This is from the uh, introduction by Dr. Walter Russell. Um, <laughs> by Yeah, I'm sorry, this is from the God will work with you, but not for you. The introduction written by Dr. Russell. This has always left me very impressed. To introduce one's wife to the world naturally leads to the temptation of exaggeration. I feel myself immunized from that, however, by the 
and possibility of it. I feel that I can say without prejudice and quite free from the fact of her relation to me that hers was the greatest mentality I have ever known. That is saying much for me, for it has been my privilege to intimately know the greatest intellectuals of our time. Go to our site, come to our museum, and you will be amazed who this man hobnobbed with. Yet among all of those great minds, he saw hers as the greatest. Why? Because she was his equal and opposite reflection, and she was his teacher. Study the works, you'll find that. So we're looking for our equal and opposite reflection within ourselves. We're looking, that leads us to seeking balance between our divided lobes of our brain, dominant masculine and feminine, at source. That's the journey. The degree to which we choose to go on that journey is great. You can take 50 lifetimes, you can do it in one. No hurry. You're the source that you're trying to rediscover in body. Great. For those that are having difficulties right now, you might think this guy is nuts, but what a journey. What a journey. <laughs> the things that we deal with, the things that we knowingly create and desire, and the things that we get that we didn't really want to think we created and desired individually, collectively blows my mind. You know, and it puts joy in life. And it's, it's the thing that, that makes me get up when life has knocked me down and say, is that your best shot? Let's go. And that joy, learning to live in that joy and getting back to it when you lose it, that's life, that's beauty, and that's discovery. And, and we're all discovering a lot about our lower nature going on around the planet right now. But that too will pass. The enlightened beings are coming in by the thousands, by the millions around the planet. In the Russell, let me, let me jump ahead here just a wee bit. So you know where we're coming from. Okay. This is the uh, cross-section picture of the wave that Dr. Russell painted. You'll see it at the museum. You'll see it on our site. This is an embodiment of the science that he was given to give to us. When they, they break that, this, they break this down, he, they. So if you look at those two zeros in the picture as stillness, as flat plane of divinity, the one true reality, and that being the one true reality desires to manifest that which it is. And then it begins and we start this climb here, that divinity, that's not mine. <laughs> divinity thinks manifestation, creation of that which it is. And the division takes place, feminine, masculine, divide and move away from each other and toward each other at the same time. The first impulse winding in here that you see, the dominant reds and oranges, is male, dominant masculine. Now that's hitting the wall I know out there today. Male, female, balance. One is not better than the other. One could not exist without the other. Both are light manifesting as both at all times. There's no particle of your being is not divided by divinity with male, female on each side. There's no body in heaven does not express it. There's nothing in all the universe, if you could get on that magic spaceship and travel forever, that you will find that does not reflect male, female, centered by divinity. Nature, the universe, is perfect in its expression because it's straight from source. We create the illusion of imperfection because we're not aware that we're straight from source yet. We're here, very early stages, very early stages. The first stage, of course, is primate, building of body. The second stage is dawn of consciousness, pagan barbarian, the Russells refer to it as. We are 
at the end of the pagan Bolvarian expression as humanity, and we are fast moving into the genius stage, which is the next stage they say we go through. That's where you begin to work knowingly as source with source. And you begin to become, picture a child riding a bicycle for the first time. Training wheels are off and off they go. They're like this, all over the place. That's pagan barbarian. They fall down, they skin their knee and their elbow, and they look around at everybody around them. It's your fault. You made that happen. Don't look at me. We're learning. It's not bad. It's not evil. We're learning. The child that is determined gets back on the bike and does it again. And eventually, they're moving into the genius stage. They got it. Not making a great deal of progress, but they got the concept. Ultimately, they evolved through the genius stage to the or to the uh, uh, illuminate stage, where they are master at going directly at what they want, what they desire. They manifest. They know that they can do it. There's no question, and you ultimately end up at the 90 degree angle from the zero of source at full embodiment, manifesting your divinity. That is what a Christ conscious being is. That's what we're going to be. Now, you could call it a God conscious being. Uh, R Russell's refer to uh, the Krishna from the Hindu religion as a Christ conscious being. Uh, if I remember my reading right, they refer to the Buddha as a Christ conscious being in the making. They are simply further up the mountain. Do you notice the shape of this? Looks like a little mountain. The Russells are simply further up the mountain. Oh, pardon me. Going the wrong way. Yeah, he'll get there yet. Hang in there, folks. I don't know how I got this far ahead. Okay. So I'll get off this slide in a minute. I'll move back to the beginning. My point is I wanted to, to let, let us see that the first major impulse inward, the inwinding, is dominant masculine. Feminine is fully present. Masculine, the inwinding is dominant because the inwinding begins the process of compression of light and heat. Masculine. And that remains so all the way through the chemical elements, which we'll just explore in a minute, until you get to the 90 degree angle, at which point the feminine and masculine halves of creation unite and they bore, born at their equator other bodies like self go forth and multiply the degree to which you know your divinity is based on whether you walked here or a christ conscious being would at center of stillness of gravity going through this is what the christ conscious being um, do you remember the story in the bible about uh, christ walking on the water i call all of them for my learning so i don't have leaning one way or the other about my divinity. I'm not condemning anything. That is a parable, a story, a lesson. In that story, they're on the waters. The winds come up, they cause a storm. We have that storm of life going on around us all the time, our individual and our collective thoughts. The question is, if you can hold center while the storm is raging around you, you are that divinity to the degree that you hold it. Remember the disciples? They're looking at the storm, totally focused on the storm. The waves are kicking, the boat is rocking, and they're certain they're all going to die. And where do they go? Down into the front of the boat where at rest was Jesus. At rest, at stillness. And called to him, Master, Master, we're all going to die. And Jesus said, can I not rest but a moment? He gets up and what's he do? He walks off of the boat and he steps out into the storm and onto the water and walks on the water. He was not distracted or disturbed in any way because his mind was here at stillness, at gravity, at center. Theirs was here in fear of the storm. And that very fear makes the storm even more dreadful. What did he do? He set an example. He said to Peter, come to me. Peter loved him. Peter loved God within and 
trusted and took that leap of faith and stepped off of the boat and headed right toward Jesus, looking him in the eye. Stillness. He was at peace. And then what did he do? He looked left. He looked right. He saw the storm. In comes fear. He began to sink. He stepped out to the illusion and that became his reality. And he began to sink. And what's the parable lesson there? He calls out, God help me, help me, Jesus. And Jesus said, look upon me, which is calmness, which is center, which is in the middle. And the moment he did, he rose up. Do you see the lesson in that story? When we are in the worst storms of our lives, that's the time to go to center and know that God is with you and manifested in your life. That sounded preachy, I apologize, but that's the way I see it. Let's get back to the show here. I believe I was up here. Yeah, what to introduce one's wife. So I'll finish that out. So he's made it clear he cannot, he, he cannot, uh, he says, I feel I can say that without prejudice and quite free from the fact of her relationship to me, that hers was the greatest mentality I have ever known. Now, why am I taking so much time to point this out? Because I'm standing in the embodiment of the collective collection of his works that by his own words, he said, this would not exist without her. I have been a student for many years. And I have watched people come in and seek to understand the science. I've had people tell me the science is all that's important. The male expression is all that's important. The feminine nature is not. The philosophy doesn't matter. The science is the most important. The philosophy matters. The science isn't important. You missed the point, guys. It's the balance between the two voiding each other out that gives you the divinity that you're seeking to discover. So can we work all of us on putting that away? You can delve into any part of that wave you want and become a master, or express your genius in it. But if you live only there, you're not going to get where you're trying to go. The discovery of God, of self, of the universal one. That's the end of the journey. But I'm not saying don't go there. <laughs> go for it. I certainly have gone there. I've gone left and I've gone right. And I find myself mentally and emotionally and physically exhausted until I meditate and pray. Decentrate, concentrate. Decentrate to know who you are and where you came from and where you're going and then manifest that in body. Creation is not without purpose. It's for here. It's for the purpose of manifesting divinity, your divinity. You're going to do it. And that's what you're looking for, peace and life. That's how you find it. Otherwise, why would these be the first two books in the course? They know. All righty. Now, did you notice down here, he says that she went out looking. This, again, is a parable about her life to seek divinity. And everywhere she went, she saw people looking for it outside of herself. I mean, outside of themselves. And she knew that they wouldn't find it there. I wish I could count how many times I was lucky enough to live and work for Mrs. Russell for two years while she was still on planet. And how many times she said to my brother, my brother, my cousin John is like my brother. How many times she said to us when we would start longing to go down to town, have a meal, maybe a beer, talk to some girls, we were in our 20s. And she'd simply gently say, you won't find it out there, sons. You won't find it. It's here. Learn what you're looking for here. And all that will come to you. And when we practice that in our lives, it has. If you'd have told me 45 years ago at 25 that I would be standing here doing this, 
I would have told you there's no way I could ever stand in front of a group of people and speak. What changed me? When I look out at the world and people and everything in it, I've reached the stage in my evolution with a long way to go. I see multiple expressions of me seeking the same thing. Who am I? Why am I here? Where am I going? Make that light contact with your fellow beings. Live that light to the best of your ability, and they will come to you. I've had it happen and say exactly what Dr. Leo said. What is it you have that I don't? I simply have knowledge of those three things through light. Who am I? Where am I going? Where am I bound? And I'd be more than happy to share it with you. You're done. What they do with it, if they accept it, is up to them. You've done your part. Live your life, and if they come back seeking more, give them more. If they don't, they'll come back in some lifetime. They'll get there. We don't get to nirvanic bliss or full understanding of our divine source without, in a civilization or a planet like ours, without everybody going there with us. There's no time clock that they have to punch. Some will make it quickly, like the Nazarene. Others will do it over a long period of time. But all of us will get there. That gives me incredible peace. Oh, all right. I can go and make some mistakes and fall away in the next lifetime or the one after. But the Brussels point out beautifully, even if you drift away and you lose sight of it, to the degree that you've been there, it's always easier to get back than it was to get there in the first place. So when you see the person sitting in the gutter with the bottle in their hand and you think, what a lost soul, you don't know in other lifetimes where they've been and what they've done. You don't know the lives they have saved and they have turned around. Don't judge them. Love them. Throw that light at them and know that they are receiving it in their being, if not here right now. I'm going to move on here. I, I can get wordy. Uh, this is the cube. We jump to this because it's the manifestation of the illusion of the universe that we live in. Well, it's not actually a manifestation. It's a model of the concept. So when you have zero curvature, cube, representation of the divine, no motion, all knowledge, all knowing, omniscient, omnipresent, forever, eternal. What's the, what's the one I missed there, guys? Omniscient, omnipotent, eternal. It manifests, it thinks. When that thinking happens, three planes are born. One, two, three, that reflect off of each other from the mirrored boundaries of that divine cube and creation is born and all the wonder that goes with it. When you look inside of this, you see that. You see the illusion of endless possibility. But you know that it's just six mirrors reflecting upon themselves. Well, if those six mirrors are reflecting upon themselves and you know that this and all we stand in is an illusion, just think on that, is an illusion, then what else are you but creator of the illusion and master of it to the degree that you know who you are? That's all the mystics have ever said, every single one of them. We've done some pretty nasty things to them. And they say, when it's all over, forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. They're not talking to the human beings that are lost in the illusion. They're talking to the divine that centers them. And at some point and at some time in their lives or subsequent lifetimes, they will know that. They will know that. It's just, it gives a whole new dimension to forgiveness. It really does. I also like from the Bible, the, the statement, uh, forgive me my trespassings. Now, there's, here's the word. As. As. 
I forgive those who trespass against me. You don't put that as in there. You don't cross that line and forgive those that trespass against you. Nothing has happened. Your divine does not know you made the statement because it's voided in the illusion. And you cycle around until you do it properly. Not a punishment, an opportunity, a learning cycle, a, a joyous journey. <laughs> I've been on a few, I used to run long distance and I, I know I'm never gonna get through all these slides, but what the heck. I used to run long distance for many years, you know, five miles on average, sometimes a little more, sometimes a little less. And I learned along the way that sometimes during each run, I would have obstacles that would make me stop or I would trip or I would hit a pothole on the side of the road or I'd turn an ankle. And the journey wasn't easy that day as it was the day before. But I always went back because I would reach a state in those runs where I was no longer body. I don't know, the scientists would tell you that endorphins kick in, but I was just alive and everywhere. And that's why I ran and ran and ran and ran until I finally got in my thirties and my poor knees said, you can't do this anymore. <laughs> I wish I could, but meditation will get you there. Practice it more. Okay, so here's the illusion within the cube. Duality, reality, illusion. If I can do this without dropping it. God's creation, God manifested. That's all we're doing. Learning to be that, the whole learning. <laughs> learning creation, learning how to control this. And you control it by learning where you came from and who you are. Then you're master of your own destiny. We'll see this happen over the next 3,000 years on this planet. Those people that are locked in the physical mindset, still at the pagan barbarian stage, will fall away. Those people that are trying to take that jump in mass to the genius stage will rise. Those people that didn't want to change, it's not a punishment. They're happy where they are, will not be able to incarnate on this planet. Those people that have learned will incarnate back on the planet, no longer pulled down by the weight of those that don't want to learn. And the Civilization on this planet will rock it into the most beautiful thing you can imagine. And this is just at the genius stage. Genius. I can't imagine what comes when we have a world full of people at the aluminum st luminate stage. And Leo told John and I once that there are entire planets and galaxies out there completely peopled by Christ conscious beings. Whoa. I'm looking forward to visiting there. Here we go. Let's get back to this. So we get lost in the illusion. And within the illusion are infinite possibilities. You saw back here. Oops, pardon me. Thought I did that right. Huh. Yeah, that might be. I'll just right click and show and go right back to it. Yeah, here we go. All right. Now, you folks can see what a master I am at this. Uh, uh, Michaela, who's the voice you hear in the background, uh, is, is, is when it comes to technology, she's my savior. And, uh, but you notice this is another view before you looked in and you saw cubes. I'm hoping I can do this without messing it up. Let me try. <laughs> Wrong way again. See, life can be distractive. There's a little storm going on here, and I'm trying to work my way through it, and I'm determined to be at peace. So remember in this slide, you see how everything is reflected in the cube's square, multiplied, infinite. If you look here, you can even see where the light begins to bend and create the wave, which winds in on itself. It creates all that we call creation. The compression of light, once it starts winding in, it cannot 
wind out. It's got to go through the cycle, zero to nine, and manifest the idea that was his desire that you're desiring to manifest until its completion. And then it radiates out towards source. Or as the Russell say, it goes through that wave cycle you saw, saw to manifestation of whatever the idea is, manifestation in perfection at divinity or something less, it's locked into nature. And by the way, those things that you do not balance, those thoughts and actions that you choose not to balance or don't know to balance, when you come back in the body, guess where they're recorded? In nature, waiting for you. They're your children. They're going to come home to you and they're going to say, balance me, love me, balance me. That's your job. That's what we're here to do. We should become more open to the idea that as things befall us in life, first off, can I clarify this? Individual journey, your journey is yours. Things that you didn't balance will reflect back to you and you will balance them. That's, that's how you complete your journey. You'll be so good at balancing them after a while that you won't even think about it. Something that you, we, we might consider negative comes our way, we simply manifest it as love. It's balanced. We get really good toward the end, high on the mountaintop. We do. We struggle at first. We shake our fist at God. How can you do this? I don't. You do. What? I don't. I'm trying to do this to a small voice. <laughs> you do. And eventually we hear, I don't. You do. Wow. <laughs> Revelation. Oh, you mean I, I need to clean up my room? Oh, that would dad meant. Oh, of course. Yeah, off we go. So we get lost in the illusion, but when you look with, with heart and love into the illusion, when you look into the abyss that we now know from the models I showed you, hopefully, is a, an illusion, not reality. But it's a wonderful thing to experience. I, I, when I give the tours, I always tell the people toward the end of the tour that I am almost, almost, without question, aware of my divinity and I'm working every day to manifest. Real easy to do when things are going well. Example I use, if I'm in the shop driving a nail and I hit my thumb for the next few minutes, it's going to be very hard to convince myself I'm not this body. Ouch. And that's because we have been building it for so many millennia from amoeba to embodiment to Christ conscious being that we've lost sight that because we are dominantly sensing in body of where we came from and who we are. And that's a wonderful thing. Can you imagine when, you, when I go to bed at night and lay this body down, I know I'm not unconscious. I'm dancing around the universe. I literally ask creator self, hey, there's got to be some unbelievable schools of study that I can be in while, I'm, while this thing's recharging. Let me take me there. I'm wide open. You know? And you go. And then you come back with more knowledge than you can conceive. And then you try to push it into this. And it's not ready to handle it yet. So it waters it down. And how do we awaken that knowledge? We know that the moment we desired it was given to us completely. And you work and you study and you work and you study and you walk in light and love and it unfolds. I watched a flower unfolding the other day and over three days on my desk and just from the bud. How can I say this gently? All bodies that reach that stage of 90 degree angle maturity burst out in flower beauty and light and all the things that go with it, including the flower itself. It is, look, there's no children out there. It is an orgasm. That flower has gone through all the stages from seed to growth and it's going, boom, see me. Look at my beauty, look at my majesty. You helped make me. Sometimes I can be driving down the street usually in the fall, and I'll watch a leaf break free from a tree, watch the vortex, 
as it works. And think, wow, how many hundreds of lifetimes have I gone through just to take the moment to witness that magnificent thing? God is showing me himself as that body falls to the ground. I'm within all things centering now. There it is. Just, ah. I get excited about life some days. Other days, not so much. But most days, it's getting better. So I, I went to this one to show you that if you look, you'll see all shapes are within the cube. Here's the, here's the, the, the uh, triangle, as you can see, or the pyramid. And if you look deeper in there and you, and you meditate on it, it's much easier to do like when I have it on a screen at home. You can see all other shapes. Remember, you come from a flat plane, and then you move into circular end winding, which is an ablation, a stretched circle. And as it moves tighter and tighter toward trying to manifest itself as its perfect reflection of cube, which is sphere, the two building blocks of the universe, cube sphere, all those things in between are not perfected yet. In our minds, God's mind, they're perfect. They're perfect. And it keeps compressing and compressing until you have a, a compressed half coming in this way from the masculine nature dominant and the pressed half is coming in this way from the feminine nature dominant. And they, dare I say, suddenly the irresistible force hits the immovable object. A perfect sphere is formed and it cannot do more. Because it cannot do more, it begins to have a hole driven through it and oblate at its center and give bodies out in return to remanifest the concept over and over and over again into eternity. Creation, Russell makes this clear, was never created. Creation is because divinity is. The only thing that separates creation from divinity is divinity is eternal, unchanged, and fixed. Creation is continuously in motion. Even science will tell you that which is continually in motion is an illusion. We're living an embodied illusion. And again, I say, isn't it wonderful? Some days not. But today, I'm having a ball. <laughs> I know we won't get through all these slides, but that's all right. All right. So Dr. Uh, Russell... Um, wrote this, and I, I, I like that that's why it's in here. It's from The Secret of Light. He points out that beyond the genius is the mystic, the illuminate. The mystic is one who has attained cosmic consciousness by a complete severance of the seats of consciousness and sensation. Omniscience comes to that person, all knowing, all presence, omnipotence. And it comes in a blinding flash of light. I had a man walk up to me in a bar once when I was in my early 20s and in the military, and he thought that I had looked at his girlfriend in the wrong way. I was young and stupid. Maybe I did. And he taps me on the shoulder, and when I turn around, all I see is this. Down I went. Before I went down, when he hit me, all I saw was a blinding flash of light. And guess where I was? <laughs> Back where I was when I was five. For what me, me seemed a second. Oh, and then I'm like trying to get up off the floor, wondering what happened. He was gone. <laughs> I'm a big guy, and I was a very strong guy in those days. So I thought he probably thought after cold hitting me <laughs> that it might be in his best interest to get out of the bar before I got up. So it wouldn't have been. I wouldn't have fought him unless I had to. Anyway, so that blinding flash of light can come in many ways. And, uh, and the, the, the thing that separates us from the illuminate or the mystic is they learn how to hold it longer than we do. And in the holding of it longer than we do, they become much more aware of how to control it, and then they start to manifest things that we find miraculous. Come to this museum, people. You will see the miraculous creation of these two people. Dr. Russell has the bulk of the embodiment of art. The museum itself predominantly given to us by Leo Russell is an embodiment and it's a piece of art. And the, the writings and the lessons are beyond measure. Uh, to me, it's nice to have the body of the museum to generate them out of, and it helps get people to understand what their capacity is. It does. 
but the, the works. And even, even then, the Russells will tell you, don't put them on a pedestal. Don't put the work on a pedestal. They are signposts leading you to the way to your own divine source. That's what they are. Do we need to take a break? Should I give people a chance to breathe? Um, all right. All right. That's fine. Yeah. Okay. All right. If I don't uh, finish a slide, because I don't always get through them, you're, it's up there. You guys are welcome to read ahead. And, you, know. and you also, by the way, my uh, email address at the university is balance, the word balance, at philosophy.org. I love to learn. If you think I've said something that's incorrect and Let's start an email talk because we'll both learn from the experience. Okay. Did I jump ahead with that? Oh, I'm sorry. Light is all there is. When man knows the light, he will know all things. Knowing your divinity is to know all things. Uh, well, well, I'm going to touch on that in a couple of slides because it fascinated me how simple this all is through the Russell teachings. Today, the light is so dim in all mankind that no one else has fathomed it. Doesn't mean that there aren't people experiencing the light, but no one has fathomed it yet among humankind to the degree that we will because we're not there yet. We're heading there. So the secret of light, which is gravity, radiation, electricity, growth, life, reincarnation, the wave, and on and on and on, all things that we see as duality in nature are, and the secret is discovering the light that centers them. And when you know that light that centers them, you've got the secret of all. You've mastered the universe. Doesn't mean you're out of here. You get to create bigger and better things. I personally believe there are beings out there that are so advanced in the light that they actually help put the planets together and bring suns into being. You know, it, it's, it's, not, it's not a short-term journey and it can be as vast as you can imagine and desire it to be, or as simple as putting a puzzle together. Do it in love, manifest the same result. The day has now dawned when we will know these things. This is man's inheritance for the new age. He's talking about the age of genius that we're moving into. We will inherit in exact accordance to that which we created. Those that want to stay here, not punishment, are happy here, they stay. Those that want to move ahead, move ahead. Those that want to manifest genius and all the beauty that goes with it, manifest it. But eventually, these people are us too. We're all one. They're let back in. And you spot this for those people who read the Bible and Revelations. Remember, they will be thrown into the pit of fire. In winding, dominant, masculine building of bodies, heat. Surrounded with the room of the cold light of space, the feminine magnetism, expansion. Gravitation, magnetism, expansion. And that which is that tension between the two, genius trying to move forward, them happy where they are. That's Armageddon. That's what it is. It's the battle between the two thought processes. They're not wrong and they're not evil. They're what they know. We're not great and better than them. We're what we know. Dr. Russell was told in, in the Divine Iliads, I hope that was where it is, while experiencing the enlightenment of the 39 days of enlightenment, I can't imagine what that must be like. He, for a moment, thought, wow, look what I know. And instantly it came back to him. Watch it. You have been, but been given a thimbleful of knowledge compared to the oceans of the world. There's much more to come. Humility, humility. All right, back, back, back. So we're, what we're talking about is the divine trinity. Male, female, that's what the wave painting showed. At the first impulse inward, the dominant masculine nature winding inward generates heat as, as around the shaft of gravity. 
and radiates toward point of maximum compression, which you'll see in the sciences at, at the carbon where that hole closes, the dominant masculine ceases to exist and the dominant feminine is born and bodies are multiplied. Mother nature. He calls them the space octaves. Science doesn't see them. They can't measure and record them. So to them, everything before hydrogen doesn't exist. Russell comes along and let me jump up here. Boy, can't be that far down. Did I miss it? Oh, here it is. <laughs> uh, all right, God, thank you for teaching me humility here. And next time, maybe, Michaela, I should just let you do this. It would probably be far less all right, of a struggle. There we go. So what, what, what they point out is, and, and the doctor admits that Leo taught him this in his first uh, scientific book to the public, uh, the, the Universal One. First, one thing he had, is he had it set up in a 10 octave wave and she corrected him and said, no, it's a nine octave wave. You want to the next power of multiplication, drop back and it repeats itself. And within that nine octave wave, all possibility exists. You don't need to jump to another, which is multiplication and a division of the two. He did what a master does. He meditated on it, thought, my God, she's right. And he changed it in his next book that he wrote with her, The Secret of Light, reflected the change. It doesn't mean that the universal one was wrong. Its charts are magnificent. But when, if you read The Secret of Light with it or after, you learn that the teacher learns too, because he's a mystic illuminate. He's not a Christ conscious being to the best of my knowledge. He's still learning. Sometimes I wonder if maybe she was, I don't know. Maybe it's because I knew her and didn't know him. And you can disagree with that. You can tell me I'm crazy. All of us will be that in that state of development someday. So here's a drawing of Dr. Russell. By the way, when you see all these drawings throughout their books on black background, that's because as he taught the course to people at the palace, he had a large blackboard there and he would draw these things on the blackboard and they would take pictures of them. That's why we have them. So this is him drawing this example. This is every one of us, whether you're biologically male or biologically female, there's no male plus female minus. There's plus radiating inward and there's feminine coming in with it and then radiating outward as a minus toward the only minus that exists which is the universal one god there's the illusion of less than and the illusion of more than but the reality is the minus that we think is not there until we know when we think it goes like this divinity there's your plus plus on each end. And that thinking process, if it's balanced, it always comes to enlightenment, an aha moment. Ah, oh, suddenly I know. If it's on balance, not letting one, not let, letting feeling speak to reason or reason speak to feeling. If one is denying the other, it's an incomplete thought, it's an imbalance. And that cannot, it will be voided in divinity. In divinity, it never existed. It's known, but it will be recorded in nature. And it waits for you. It's parents to come back and love it and balance it. So you get the concept here, thinking, thinking, knowing, knowing, plus, plus. Um, Darren has given speeches here, our science officer, and he could be probably grimacing over there thinking, oh, Jim, that's the worst explanation I ever heard, but he'll be back. <laughs> I just got a thumbs up, so I feel much better. <laughs> so you read these things, you understand where, the, where our soul seed is, is centered. It's in the pituitary. And that uh, as we unfold through interaction with thoughts individually and collectively, and we learn to hold that center. Eventually, you hold that stillness. Right now, we pass through it. 
eventually you start to hold that stillness. You're closer to that gravitational line. And then suddenly you're there and <laughs> out of body you go, illumination, enlightenment, and you go, you no longer say, I think, you say, I know, and what I know, I think. <sighs> Creation. So let's do a little wind up here in this concept. God is one in all cause, but in effects, there are three. And all that are three are nine. For all that are three are multiplied by, all right, I lost myself here, multiplied by three in this visible cube dominated universe of three dimensions. Well, what three dimensions he's talking about? reflective mirror cubes that are winding up to make that perfect sphere so that they can give back to stillness that was given to them. That's what they're talking about. The illusion. Let's see if we can get reality to sit here. There we go. So here's what goes on universally. Mind decentrates electric thinking to imagine idea, then concentrates to form a moving body image of idea. Light, dark. Mind that we embodied, picture a 360 degree circle, the average human being is sense aware of about 15 to 18% of that 360 degrees. That's all they know. They see this as reality. It allows us to work on this stage of creation to experience and to create. The illuminate, when they go into full-blown illumination, sees the 360 degree circle in that state, understands the divinity that centers them in all things, then brings that knowledge back into body. Now they're no longer at 15 to 18%, they might be at 20 or 30%, but they have to work within the body that they're, if they, know too much light and bring too much light in, the body ceases to be. So they learn to work from that expanded state. Uh, John forgets this, my cousin, he forgets this. And I know I know it happened to him. I came back once and he'd been walking with Mrs. Russell in the woods and we would always let her walk ahead about 20 paces and we'd walk behind so she could enjoy it. <laughs> she would stop, she would always go like this before she, she stopped walking, she'd always go like this. And then she turned around and she goes, John, isn't it magnificent? Isn't it beautiful? And she's in the woods. And he goes, what? The birds? She goes, well, yes, but I'm watching this water run out of the ground as sap up through the trees, the multiple colors of it, and pouring out through the leaves into this air. They see what we don't see. Just the description. Boy, would I like to experience that someday. And will. So will you. So they have an expanded range and understanding of the color universe that we're in. They see colors and, and, and know things that we don't know. They, they sense things far beyond our sense range. They almost have a radar. You know, Dr. Russell could tell you so many things that were happening within the planet as the plates themselves moved across each other. He would know it. He would feel it. Uh, Leo probably too. Leo wasn't uh, as descriptive in her abilities. Um, I know from having lived there for two and a half years, she had them. We witnessed things that blew her mind. And, uh, and I'm sure she withheld a lot more than she could have shown us because I, she probably looked at it as braggadocious. Yeah. <laughs> Quick story, John tells it all the time. Let me know if I get into time trouble, will you? Okay. So what what uh, what was I going with that? Somebody feed me the sentence back I just said. No, I, yeah, I finished that one. <laughs> I was moving on, anyway. Yeah, the color expansion and all that, uh, but I was trying to point out that her and her talking to us, and I'm sorry that it slipped my mind. It'll probably fall right back into it. 
Right. Yeah, there, there, uh, there are many things that, a simple one for me. At one point walking around the mountain, we'd been there a little over a year, maybe a year and a half, and we were walking around together because in the previous walk, she had pointed out to me or John, I don't remember who, a log laying on the ground about 20 feet long. And she took us over and she showed us on the edge of the wall. She said, look, this is where Dr. Carved the heart in our initials, Dr. Love's layout. You know? So that evening after work, John and I rush back out there and we get a couple of logs. We have a, you know, what do you call those things you dig a hole with? Thank you, post hole digger. And we dig down there along the path and we take two pieces of logs and we shove them in the hole. And then we take that log and we lift it up and we sit it on top of it. So now there's this 20 foot long bench with his carving on the one side for us to sit on when we'd walk with Leo. She, we thought she'd like that. And then the next time she was due to walk, we said to her, can we both go with you? And she played dumb and me. Sure, I, she knew what we did. She did. You just have to trust me on that. She knows. We walk around, we get to where the log is, and she is, oh, this is so lovely. Thank you. Let's sit. Come sit with me. So she sits in the center of the log, and I sit on her right. Left, I'm sorry, John sits on her right. And we're sitting there, and we look over at Leo, and she looks over at us, and the log breaks right in the middle. All three of us fall backwards onto the forest floor, which is very soft. So you got a picture now. Here's a... I don't have anything that looks like that. Oh, yeah. Here's the log. It's now broken in half, and we're sitting on it with our legs over it like this, our backs on the ground. This log was about yay thick log. So she looks over at John, and she looks over at me, and she goes, well, perhaps doctor didn't appreciate me sitting on his log with you two young men. <laughs> And we just broke up. And while John and I are laughing at the situation, we witnessed the most amazing thing that I've ever witnessed physically in my life. This woman who had her, who's in her 60s at this point and had her legs over that log with her back on the ground, went from that position to straight standing up. And I looked at him and he looked at me, we're like, whoa. Now here we are in our 20s and we're trying to get our legs off the log so we can get on our side so we can push ourselves up. And she went, boom, boom. that's the stuff that they don't tell you they're capable of and they don't show it off. But when you witness it, you know, okay, it's a humbling moment for me. Hey, by the way, the people out there don't believe that, that's fine. You'll find your illuminate someday, but it's not you yourself and you'll witness it. So well, we left off over here with the, I, just, I finished this whole thing. The, the point that, that I, I want to remind us of here is when you look at the, the Trinity, what Russell's referred to the Trinity, male, female, divinity, uh, and when male and female see the light of divinity in each other, reflected in each other, they discover the divinity within them. That's what the divine Trinity is as they depict it. You'll also notice that feminine winds in at the blue violet, through the blue to the green, and they meet as one at yellow, which is how we see it. The reality, our senses can't see what it is. It's just a pure white light of divinity. We can't register it in our eyes. When you reach near the, the mountaintop of your divinity, as Leo would say, you will see it as white. You will see ranges. I guess the term would be that, that the blues and the greens and the yellows and the oranges broaden in spectrum. You see more hues of them. I don't think that they there's. I don't think there's just there's other colors than this that, that I'm aware of. You know, maybe they are. There, Darren didn't throw anything at me, so I must be not too far off. He says I'm good. Okay. <laughs> so, and then of course the the, the males coming in at, at, at the red violet, uh, and and I saw the blue violet with a female. Red violet to the red to the orange to the yellow. We become from life to life reflections of the opposite biologically. You've been male, you'll be female. You've been old, you've been young. You've lived long, you've lived short. You've been good by that imbalance measurement. You've been bad. But the more you do love, the more you do balance, the more you do good, the closer to the center of that vortex here, these two vortexes, the closer to the center you ride, 
at stillness, at gravity shaft, at divinity, the less disruption you make along the way. There used to be a, a program on years and years ago with David Carradine that I love called uh, Kung Fu. Yeah, and at the beginning of that show, they would show him toward the end of the little opening where the master would say to him, walk across the rice paper. And he would walk to and from, and he would leave rips in the rice paper. That's what we do when we leave in balanced thoughts and actions in life. That was the example given there. Then he says to him, when you can walk to and from without ripping the paper, you will be ready to leave here. He was saying, when you can walk in light and in balance in all things, you're ready to go out and experience life. That's what the, the creator says to us all the time. And we're not supposed to stop halfway across and say, look, I ripped the paper. And we're not supposed to stop ripping the paper as we learn. We simply know what the goal is. Walk in balance. Eventually we all do. Eventually we all, I guess, move on. Yeah. I have a hard time thinking that we just stop. We rest. Oh, I got to give you what Matt has told me a hundred times. And, and I love it. I should have done it at the beginning of this thing. Matt Presti, he's our president. And uh, who's on a journey with some other people here to a new venture. And he's, he's uh, going to be giving up the presence shortly. And my cousin, John Bonzel will be taking it over. And uh, it's, it's a nice, loving passage that's going on. So you'll see that with changes that are announced online and stuff. Oh, I was going to talk to you. The, 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 one of the great reminders as you go through any moment of your waking day, sometimes as you're waking up, is the breath. You start from absolute expansion of breath to the ability that you can in a body and then you draw inward to maximum compression that the body can do in the lungs and you start it from rest you go to rest in body you give back all that you took in in body to rest that is the secret of the universe that's all you're witnessing I don't care whether you're looking at the development of, of, of a galaxy over hundreds of trillions of years or a single breath that you're taking. The principle is right there. Compression, rest, expansion, rest. Life, body, rest. That's it. So when you think this is confusing, sometimes just stop and listen to yourself breathe. That's all you're witnessing. Whether you're looking at the evolution 186,400 times a second of a corpuscular unit of light through that nine wave octave that we showed you in the picture or the expansion of the entire galaxy. Breathe in, breathe out. Compress, expand. Generate, radiate. That's it. All righty, I have this one up here because I want to remind myself and you that what, remember that you see here, is that clear on the board up there? Okay, you see that's the, that's in this, in my example, that's not the example he's making here directly, but in my example, this is that 360 degree cycle I told you about. When you know the whole 360 degree circle, you know yourself as divinity. You know yourself as reflected from cube source you know that you are a body within the illusion of reality and that the reality is that which you came from and to return. But while we're in body at this 15 degrees, we are limited in that sense range. In this range where we are right now, we see, we have, let me put it this way, we have the joy and the privilege of seeing light divided. Darkness is light. Space is dark to us because it's expanded way beyond our range of sight to see it as light. Light is seen to us when it is compressed because it is compressed to the point that it falls within our sense range and we can record it. Breathe in, breathe out. Darkness, breathe out. Light, breathe in. Reality, right here. All there is is light.
So over here, what did I write? I'm sorry, what did Dr. Russell write? When man knows the light, he will know all things. Did we read this already? Fathom the secret of the light and gravitate. Yeah, I did. I, I, doubled, I doubled up on that. That was probably my subconscious saying you need this. All right, so here's this. I love this picture, and I put it up again. It's, it's the Trinity again. But note the, the, uh, the, the authority. Always when you're reading the Russell material, note the authority with which they speak. They don't ever speak from I think. They speak from the illuminate that they are. I know. Having a written text from one of those minds is incredible. Having a dual text from them both to study this is an epic time in our existence. Anybody that can grasp onto this before it's passed through five, 600 years, and those people that think they know how to explain it better, get a hold of this stuff. You're going to have more of a struggle with it. It's pure right now. It's pure. And I recommend every book they have. I do. I read them all. And the home study course, I'm, 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 I'm reading until the last breath. I will never stop reading it. Keeps me centered. Also, atomic suicide, I could not urge this more. This message was given in 1951. Now, I don't know what's going on in our atmosphere because by their standards, we shouldn't be able to survive on this planet right now. I can only assume that there are beings far greater than me at this point in my evolution that are working with us because the atmosphere should be dissolving because they point out in here, Radiation in the ground fulfills a purpose. It's spread out, it's limited, more, more you know, compressed some areas than others, and it breaks down rock into soil where moisture can enter. And then there's an interchange between soil and atmosphere, and atmosphere is created between heaven and waters of the earth. When you take that radiation that is designed to be in planet, to do the job of creating the evolution of that planet and you put it compressed and in great, what is it? Something like a half a pound of plutonium would destroy the entire planet. It let, let, I mean, this is just, it's, it's mind boggling to me. This was their warning to us. It will do in the atmosphere what it did in the ground. They said in 1951, you will see massive holes form starting at the poles and radiating outward because that radiation is taking our protective shield away. Science knows it now. They're doing what they can to control it. And I think they're getting help from somewhere else. I wouldn't begin to know. I'm gonna assume it's higher beings. That's, that's my belief. Because we shouldn't, with plutonium, I mean, with, with Nakash, Nakash, Nakashima, Hiroshima? No, not, what's the big, Fukushima. With Fukushima, with six plants, in partial or total meltdown, pouring unbelievable amounts of radiation into our oceans, which is being released into our atmosphere. I don't know how we're still here. They can tell you how we can turn it around. And I think someone is. Oh, last thing here, my favorite chapter in this book, and I've read it over and over and I'll never stop reading it is, you wanna hear the knowing in this? We define God. It's epic. All right, back to this thing. So the, the centering thought that we want to have as we seek to hold our divine nature is the understanding that the feminine masculine balance, man, woman balance, not man repressing the feminine, not woman repressing the masculine, that's imbalance. Balance. When they are balanced and seeing the light of the divinity in each other, they void themselves out as body and they come to know themselves as source creator. World peace through world balance. The principle of love is desire to give. Leo says in her uh, code of ethics, uh, do only that which makes you loved. Do you hear the power word in that? Makes. Makes. You don't do it for gain. You don't sit back and say, well, I'll give 
that guy love because he's a good neighbor and I like him. The one over there, he's not getting my love. Division. You just created a chasm between him and yourself, and it will create, what, what's the word I'm looking for? Tension. Tension. He may not even know you dislike him in body, but he knows it at source or as close to source as he can imagine. It will manifest in his mind, and there will be a resentment that will multiply that action. Do only that which makes you love it. You don't, you don't need to put judgment into it. You don't need to, to, to look at them as less than because they didn't receive it on the, in the way that you meant it. Just do that which makes, makes, makes you love it. Makes. It's action. It's active. And judge them not for what they do. My wife tells me that I come across lecturing sometimes. I don't mean to. This stuff just excites me. It really does. And, and all I've wanted to do since I was in my 20s and first read it is share it with others. And I like every one of you out there that's on that route. <laughs> it doesn't always make you loved, but you give it anyway. You give it anyway. And, but it makes you ecstatic when you see someone pick this up, especially someone that's struggling, and watch the immense beautiful change that can happen in their lives. It's mind-blowing. And then think back on the immense, beautiful change that's happened in your own. And that which you gave is going to go out to its cube boundary of maximum expansion. Guess who it's coming back to? Looking forward to those presents, hoping the ones that weren't so balanced are a little slower in return, but I'll deal with them. Yeah, I'll deal with them. Okay, so what was Dr. Russell? His longest illumination was for 39 days and night. His first was when he was seven. He had intermittent ones every birthday coming in and out at varying degrees, but every seventh birthday where they were focused and more intense. By the time he reached his 49th year, your biblical seven times seven, the multiplication, the numerology, and all that stuff. He had his mass one, 39 days and night. Now he was married with children and had friends and family who were used to this happening to him. But after about a month, they think, oh boy, he lost it this time. He's not coming back. He's crazy. So he's over there communing with Source, working on how to write his divine Eliots, which are in two books. This is what he discovered over there, straight from Source. Your Source too, guys. This is just his symphony of what he found over there. If you went through the same experience, you'd write your own. And you might call it my divine alien. Both are beautiful, both are from source, both are masterful. We all have the ability. All of us have the whole museum is not here to show you how great he is. It's here to inspire you to show you how great you can be. Desire what you will. So let's jump into that for a second. So he's told a lot of things and taught a lot of things. He brought a lot of things back. He wrote them in the divine village to direct others and himself, remind himself. And the two major things that he was told to do were be an example of how to awaken your inner genius to others. Not be a show off, be an example. So when people walk into the museum, we start the tour. The first thing I say is, this is not here to show you what he can do. This is here to inspire you as to what you can do. So here he goes. Let me jump over here. I'm gonna, I'll be back. Hopefully I'll do this smoothly. Okay. So he was already a master musician at that age. He played the organ and the piano masterfully. He had already mastered painting at that age. He had them and he was known around the world for his paintings. But he had never done architecture. He had never done sculpture. He had never written extensively in poetry and writing. And then he had to be the example. He mastered all of these things. And when you come to the museum or you go to our site, you can see all the pictures of all the works that we have on hand and some others that we don't have here. This is a, a upstairs, I'd say it's about a 32,000 square foot museum. If you put the whole building together, it's closer to 37, but there's an art store downstairs that's being cared for and will come up in time. But if you look at all the art in here, which is over 60 tons of art and sculpture, 
This man lived to be 92. And this is only 2%, 60 tons is only 2% of what he made in his lifetime. Imagine that. 98% of the things that he made, most of them are still here in people's homes and attics and elsewhere. Beautiful, masterful works of art that not only display his ability to master and conquer these things, but show us that we can too. And every piece of art that he has is built in accordance with light, color, music, and the sacred name, geometry. It's reflected. There was a man walked in here that was a, a museum, a, a musician who was the head of an orchestra a year and a half ago. I'm over giving a tour by the, the Mark Twain Memorial that Dr. Russell did. And this is what I hear in the background. Every hair on my body is standing. And I look over and he's standing there with a woman and she's looking at him and he goes, he looks back at her. This place is singing to me. He's a musician. That's what he got. And I walked over when I got done with that group. I said, excuse me. I walked over and I was talking to her a while. And I said, that's because every piece of art in this building is perfectly symmetrically balanced in its expression. That's why people look at it and they see it as something more than they know and they want to come back or they want to be able to do that. This is what a mystic master does. You see it in Michael. Uh, what, what's Michael's where, where uh, Mother Mary's holding Jesus? That, that You see it in that. I've looked at thousands of Renaissance paint, paintings done by very talented you know, artists and seen them do beautiful portraits of women. But still, you stand in front of the Mona Lisa and that mystic put that geometry, color, frequency in that work, and you can't look away. Your soul recognizes it as perfection. Perfection. So here he did it. He spent the rest of his life at the age of about... Uh, in his 30s, uh, uh, I'm sorry, not in his 30s, in the 30s, <laughs> he began to build buildings had, and, and mastered them. You know, there's art students, uh, not architectural students that have come from around the world and marvel at his buildings. The man never took an architectural uh, uh, class in his life, but he knew universal law. He knew universal symmetry. He understood universal geometry, and he built everything that he built in exact accordance from it. And there's, uh, someone came in here, and it wasn't me, they told somebody else, and maybe before we were in here, they were explaining that they knew some people that lived in one of his buildings that's still there today. They die in those buildings. They don't ever sell. They say there's something about living here that is rejuvenating. It's perfectly balanced embodiment reflecting divinity as architecture. Uh, when you do our tour downstairs, I, I should have had it in here, the Mark Twain Memorial, which uh, Dr. did, which I consider to be his most magnificent art piece because it's the difficulty level that he put into it. And, and you can find that out. Come see Michaela and I, we'll tell you about it. But in that art piece, he had the, uh, this symmetry I'm talking about. He had 23, was 23 or 28 separate figures. 26, well, I was in the ballpark. 26 separate figures in this. He had only started sculpting when he was 56 years old. So he's maybe a few years, five, six, seven years past that. <laughs> and this musician who is there getting sculpted, his name was Oscar Gibralowicz. And just by chance, he happened to be married to Mark Twain's daughter, but he was also a master pianist. And he was also the head of Chicago Orchestra at the time. He came to get sculpted. And while there in Dr. Russell's studio in New York City, I believe it was top, the top of Carnegie Hall then, he is standing in front of that memorial. And he says, he goes like this, this is, this is positively musical. So he gets a piece of paper and he draws that stuff that musicians draw on there. You can see right away, I'm not a musician, those lines and the big G and all that stuff. And he puts notes where every head is of those 26 figures. And he goes over to the grand piano and he sits down and he starts playing and it's a beautiful melody. And he hollers out to Dr. Russell, do you hear that? It's absolutely musical. And he goes, well, of course it is. It's perfect. It's geometric. It's color balanced. It's a reflection of balance and divinity. 
It's frequency. It has to be musical. Never question it. You just know. That's what we're learning to do. That's what we're learning to ascertain. We're trying to build a body that matches the imagination of our divinity that is perfect. Oh. I know all of you looking at me think, boy, that guy's got a long way to go. I'm working on it. I'm working on it. All right, so let's jump over to this. I'm going to go one pass. These are his two charts of the wave. The second thing that he was told to do was give the complete science of the universe to humanity. By that, I mean this. Let me see if I can do this in one jump. Here. This is a close-up. <laughs> of course, it didn't go that way. I don't know what I keep doing, Michaela. I'm on the right, but it just doesn't like me on the right for some reason. Hang on. Do you see the struggle? Everything you do isn't perfect. <laughs> the secret is to staying calm in the middle, in the midst of the storm. So where was I? I was up here. Okay. So if you this round chart, they're both the same chart of the same elements. If you want in here with, 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 with your finger and, and drew that chart out, it would look like the chart on the left. That's all it is, same chart. I find it much easier to work with and explain the chart on the left than I do the one in the middle. That takes a much more intense and, and broad thinking scientific mind than I have. This works for me. And then only limit, limited. So what I'm gonna do is focus in on this area of the chart that you see here in the next picture. So you see it, what I did is I just focused in on that area. On the Mendeleev chart of elements, which is a great chart, the man was a mystic, he deserves full credit for it, what he got there. You go up here and Mendeleev's chart starts at hydrogen. and goes from hydrogen to helium and then progresses into carbon then downward through the cycle to zero, which science sees as the big bang. They see or summarize that there was this massively compressed, I don't know, ball of hydrogen. I don't know how big or small it was that for some reason was motivated to explode into life. Why do they think that? Because they can't measure anything beyond it. And they can't measure anything beyond it. They see it as something with only one molecule. I don't know whether that's true or not. I'd have to ask Darren. But if there are wave cycles, as Russell says, proceeding hydrogen, it can't be, I'm guessing, am I right? It can't be just a single molecule. Is, is that pre-molecule? Is that what I'm talking about? Okay, so negative meaning they can't measure it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can see the difficulty. So science being science, they measure what they can observe. It takes the position of hydrogen, boom, big bang, radiation outward to point of maximum compression at carbon, radiation beyond that down to zero, death. It's a dying universe. What Russell know and came to show them, if you look back up at the hydrogen again, in between hydrogen and helium, he has three unknown elements marked. Mendel's chart doesn't show them because he couldn't pick them up. I don't know why, he didn't. Before that, there's an additional 18 in the three wave cycles preceding that. 21 new elements that precede or are just after hydrogen that is all known to science because they can't do measurement of it. But they're there and what they are is massively unfolded, large, huge columnar waves, not super compressed. They're on the very beginning of the inwinding and they can't measure that. But Russell makes it very clear through meditation, you can come to know it. And when you know it, you can use it. Through desire to know it, you can come to manifest it in the laboratory. This is happening around the world and it's happening among us. And people, we get feedback from people around the world and within our community telling us, yes, it's real, yes, it's there, and yes, we can utilize it. All of these things in the, let me jump back here. For a minute. We're talking here. Here's carbon, hydrogen carbon, octave. 
a dying universe. Now, this feminine is actually winding in, just bear with me here. A dying universe, it's actually, it's actually unwinding this way at the equatorial line, but I'm using this for explanation. They see it as unwinding down to zero from which it came. What they don't see is that winding inward, the winding up. And because they don't see that, they think that the universe is dying. But as it's re-giving what they call dying, it's also generating at the same time, eternally, cyclically, forever. All right, now I'm gonna really mess this up, so Darren's gonna save me. It is voided as it happens, recorded. It is recorded as it happens, voided as it is recorded, and repeat it, or repeat it as it is recorded. There's a correct way to say it, and I never remember it, but, but I will, I will. It's called the voidance principle. What I told you was the wrong principle, but the concept is all things that are happening are de-happening at the same time that they're happening, because remember, we're living in an illusion that we have attached our emotions and reason to, so it feels real to us, because what are we recording? Frequency. And that frequency that we're recording experiences are our senses. And any wire that is our senses can be overloaded. We call it pain, suffering. Yes, ma'am. Like, uh, like, okay, I'm going to try and say that. My wife just toned in, I'm told, and, and, and the correction that she gave me. Voided it as it occurs. Record it as it is voided and repeat it as it was recorded. That's the eternal expression of divinity in body. Uh, all righty. So let me jump back here. So, so what we've shown is in the Russell chart of the elements, he made them aware that there are 21 elements after hydrogen and preceding it. Uh, young, brilliant minds right now are discovering this and understanding with it that these are sources of energy that are completely non-polluting. It's why? Because it's from the generating inside of nature, not the radiating dying side of nature. There's no residual leftover when you burn it or, or, or compress it or all the other things that they do. I'm gonna turn a little bit to this chair over here because my knees are getting a bit tired. But follow that concept. These young, brilliant minds that are hitting the planet today because they are inheriting genius. They start to know there's something here to work with and they go inside and they find out what that something is and they manifest it in body. With authority, with trust, with absolute knowledge that they can do it. It's the only thing accepts, as Russell says, that's the genius is only separated by, the mediocrity and genius are basically only separated by desire. When your desire is strong enough, you're moving toward genius. When it's weak, you're stuck at mediocrity. Neither one is evil or wrong. They're just manifesting the concept of creation. These knees, I told you how I ran for many years. Small price to pay for all the joy of See if I can sit on this without falling over. All right. So as we discover these things, these preceding elements, and begin to manifest free energy, I don't know if I agree with the term free. I've seen the people that are manifesting that energy, and they work their behinds off. They don't get it for free. They may be able to use it so that you don't get charged for it because there's no cost at manifesting it. But they work, well, Edison, genius. 98% perspiration, 2% inspiration. There it is. But that 2% inspiration, 2% of his work in the museum, that says a lot. It really does. So, okay, simplify this. I'm going to move to the next one. He says, well, there it is. Back to here. Let's make it big. Yeah, I didn't do that. All right. There we go. So let's go back to here for a minute. 
let's give some examples. The, the whole uh, uh, part of this was uh, knowing your divinity. And the other part was if you can count from zero to nine, you can master the secrets of the universe. That's what the Russell science teaches in, in a nutshell. So let's go back to this chart. Well, here you are at absolute cube boundary, stillness, flat plane, no reflection. White light does not reflect itself because it's white light. When you divide it and it's reflected off of that screen of white light that we see as darkness, it reflects back as embodiment. Let me take this thing. See if I can do this without dropping it. Just a flat mirror. Doesn't matter whether it's square or round, it's just a flat mirror. It's an example. Divinity at rest. Divinity thinks self, body. Body begins to wind in towards self. Light begins to wind in toward heat and generation and compression. As that happens from that flat plane, this sphere begins to wobble. We don't see it because our senses don't register this motion. It's going on around us right now. We don't see it. It gets all the way up here around hydrogen, then we begin to see it. Then it becomes become visible as it spins faster and faster and faster and faster. Then it becomes reality to us, even though the divine in us knows that it's a false reality. It's our reality and body. And then that reaches point of maximum compression at 90 degrees from source. Adam, dominant masculine, or sorry, divinity, God, thinks Adam, dominant masculine, remember, Feminine is fully present, almost exactly equal to dominant masculine, but the masculine input is the first impulse. That's why the scientist Jesus referred to our father, dominant masculine, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. What comes next? Thy kingdom come. When it hits hydrogen, we can start to record the kingdom within our visual range and our mechanical range. And as it's winding in, this is what's happening. Can you see that? Can people see that? This is what's going on. More and more and more, faster and faster and faster. Did you ever go to a store where they have those little things you drop the coin in for the kids? It's, it's a vortex. And the coin goes in, and they, and they have it set to go on just the right angle. And the momentum and the weight of the coin, you see it take off. And it takes this long, slow wind around the top and the neck a little bit further in. And each time it goes down a little bit further, and it, gets a little bit more, it goes a little bit faster. And that which was like this going in is moving more and more and more to that 90 degree outer center. By the time it gets down toward the bottom, it's spinning at 90 degree angle from center. Masculine, dominant, I can't see my thing. Feminine dominance born here at the equator. The two become one. Feminine, masculine winds inward and compresses. Feminine dominance winds outward and expands. Equal but opposite. If feminine is not treated embodied equal to the male embodied, the feminine falters and falls, the male nature gets stronger and more destructive and things don't happen war and destruction and horror happens if feminine takes over dominion and starts radiating male faster before it can radiate up in balance with divinity at center then the feminine becomes the dominant and things don't get done male in each of us want to create feminine in each of us is the giver of creation. Working together, you manifest divinity. But back to this thing again. So now you've wound up and now you're like this. You're at 90 degree angle from source. Adam, Eve, creation. Biblically, they call it the fall of man. It's not. It's the fulfillment of the desire of the expression of body. We fall into a material self not knowing fully where we came from. Eden, knowing, knowledge of self. Because why? This thing is now spinning like this. The pull outward to compression and inward is so strong. We're so dense 
at the carbon octave that we think ourselves to be body. But that cycle will be fulfilled. If you could see where I'm sitting, there's a hole forming at the top. That's the black holes that they talk about in space and the other stuff that goes with. As that 90 degree angle begins to give back what it was given, going back towards stillness at source, you see it speeding up faster and faster and faster, more and more dense. This is how we get lost in the illusion. The pressure out toward embodiment is so extreme when we just live in our senses that we forget completely because we're constantly fulfilling the demands of the body, the wants of the body. When we fall to our feminine nature, seeking appetites over knowledge, that's the image of the Eve. We fall back toward density. We, we stay out here locked onto density. We're denying both our feminine and masculine natures and we're becoming, we're dying. We just start, we die and eventually, we begin to radiate so fast. What's this thing doing? Now it's at high speed going back to the source from which it came. You live longer, you're healthier, you're happier when you seek to give love and divinity. When you don't, you quickly return back to source. Yep. I dropped the entire world, forgive me. All right. Yeah, I, I tried to record it backwards and I couldn't do it. Well, we'll work. Yeah, Michaela's saying that she would love to have seen me have that in, in a film at stillness winding in. And I tried to do it, but I don't have yet. I'm working on it, the technical skills. She probably does, and I'm sure Darren back there does too. Uh, Michaela's it's operations manager here along with me and, and, and Darren's the science officer. And, and he hasn't run screaming out of the room through this whole thing. So I guess I'm doing okay. So let's do a real quick close, quick close on this. So, so this is one, oh, <laughs> gotta stay off of that button. Let's see if I can do this, Michaela. Oh, no, wrong way. Right click previous. Oh, thank you. Previous again. Previous again. I wouldn't realize what that for. Yeah. So here we are at, at zero divinity. Now you're born into life as, as the human beings that we are. You begin to generate in and your, your dominant uh, generation winding up through these three cycles to maturity. So what's the biblical one? Four score and four, 84 years, roughly 42 years of age. So you start off here in womb. Cycle's always the same, building body. You're born, you go through the different levels of maturity until you reach maturity at 42, roughly. And then you begin to not generate as fast as you are radiating. It's called age. Those people in here like me, we see it. We see the ablation of, ablation of our cells. We see that we hold more water. We know the badder we are that is our body does not have the stamina and energy it did when we were over here radiating or generating more than we were radiating. And then eventually we re-give, there's no take in the universe, give, re-give that body back to where our divine self, to the degree that we know it, rests. Goes through that cycle of rest, eventually desires to come back into embodiment and you radiate back in it. That's the reincarnation principle. Zero, four plus plus, four plus plus, centered by divinity at zero, divinity embodied, winding back to divinity universally. There you are. That took about 84 years. Now let's call this thing up here a corpuscular unit of light or a proton electron. Now that can come in, go through this nine octave cycle. He did it again. I'll listen to you this time. You go through that nine octave cycle 186,400 times a second. That's the measure of the repetition of light. That little, I'm not a scientist, proton, electron, corpuscular unit of light goes through that nine octave sec that many times a second. It's a moment. 
you see what happened here? 84 years to complete it for us on average, 186,000 times a second for that little sun that we call corpuscular units of light. Now let's call this thing up here at center a star. Same nine octaves, same principle. It just winds up and it might take 84 trillion years for it to go through that nine octave cycle back to zero, from zero to zero. Time is irrelevant. The principle is zero to nine. The nine octave wave, the chart that he gave us. There it is. That's what he literally means when he says, if you can count from zero to nine, you can master the secrets of the universe. It's not difficult. Breathe in, breathe out. Back to the same chart. Now this chart, which you've seen previously, watch what happens when you take this chart and you go over here and you superimpose it on this chart, the painting of the wave cycle. Do you see how it matches it perfectly and has those locking points that it goes in and out of from, from wave cycle to wave cycle with rest at center throughout the entire journey with compression toward density happening at the walls of that spinning outward, what we call gravity. It's not gravity, it's a compression. Would, would that be in, intense magnetics? What would it be, Darren? When you're pushed up against light. Remember the things when you were kids, you'd go to the fair and they'd start spinning the thing around and then they'd drop the floor out from under you and you're stuck on the wall. Darren says that's called centrifugal force. When we are in that state of being held up against the wall and we feel heavy and embodied and we sense the need to resist or not resist. If you resist and you think on center, if you look at the stillness between you and the person on the other side spinning around, there's nothing happening there. Enlightenment. Well, oh, I have to be centered there. This is not me. I'm this. I'm there. Oh, these things happen. And this is what he's showing you here. This wave cross section of wave painting is showing you how this works. He's showing you the inert gases. That's those soul seed gases that, that set center just off of, of, of the stillness. They circle around it. They cycle around stillness. I am within all things at stillness centering them without all things controlling them, but I am not the things I center and control. That's the beautiful illusion of it. You are not your body. That doesn't mean that you sit in the corner and drink yourself to death. That's not fulfilling your purpose, but if that's your greatest desire, go for it. So he is showing you in this painting, the reality of the chart of the elements and that you live here. In one of these octaves, right now, where most of us are living in the, in the carbon octave, which what's the, the is it hydrogen that, that's the first impulse into the carbon octave, right? So we come in at hydrogen, we're born out of a hydrogen octave, and we, and we leave out of the, uh, I can't read that, Darren, help me. Yes, but I, I mean, but once we radiate out, we're going into the next inert gas, which is the beginning of the Neon, thank you. The beginning of the next octave. When you know that, when you're running center here at divinity, when you're holding close to divinity, close to your soul seed, that's very near to divinity, that then you are aware of self as more than body. Then you manifest magnificently. Uh, and, you, and you understand that this is a cycl cyclic principle. Uh, the inert gases, Russell says, aren't, aren't even elements. Now, science records them as elements, but they're not. They are the bridge at stillness between absolute stillness of divinity and soul seed. They are Christ consciousness. That's where you come from. You come from Christ consciousness, either in this, with awareness of the soul seed from which you were born, that you can go back to in meditations. That's the extreme ex expansion of nature. People take drugs all the time so they can go back to where they come from to sense that. They're still 
They're not sensed at soul C, but they're trying to slow the body sensation down to the point that they can become aware of where they came from. It's the shortcut. It doesn't work. Meditation and prayer take you straight there. And eventually you become master of those nine octaves, and then you're a fully Christ conscious being. Jesus said to the disciples, they came back and they said, where have you been? And he said, I was in the higher heavens teaching and in the lower worlds. I was in the ex extreme expansions of the wave teaching. And I was in the most compressed areas of, the, of, of, of those worlds embodied teaching. That's where I was. And how can it be all places at once? Because he's at divinity. He's not embodied, aware of that, the universal one. That's why he refers I and the Father. The universal one is absolute stillness. You just know there. You don't talk. You don't think. You just know. You just know. That's what I experienced when I was drowning. I was embodied, attached, but I was so close to that center shaft because of that near-death experience, I experienced divinity. I was simply close to core. Scientific. Gail was telling me I got to wrap this thing up. So let me, we touch on all, let me touch on this real quick, Michael. All right. So remember this reflective, uh, uh, three, three reflective shields that, that, that show the field creation. Zero, 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 zero. This radiates from here at source out to a point of light at maximum compression in body. And there's nine of these zeros on this plane. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, divinity at center nine. And on this plane, and on this plane, remember? Nine multiplied by three. I don't remember the exact saying. Yeah, three by three equals nine. I don't know if you ever played with it. No matter how many times you multiply nine, it always comes back when you compress all the numbers as nine. No matter how many times you multiply divinity as body, it always comes back to divinity. You can't stop it. You can't. And you don't want that. Let's jump out here. The expanded wave, that which we see as space is black. Eight corners centered by stillness of divinity in the center nine. Nine times nine is 18, which is nine. And that's the end of it. If you can count from zero to nine, you can master the secrets of the universe. Thanks, guys. Uh, those folks that are out there on Zoom, if they have any questions, uh, they can write them in on Zoom and, and Michaela will announce them to me. Uh, I will answer what I can. I will finish that sentence with, you can get the answer to anything you want to know best by going within and talking to creator directly. You don't need a middleman. No, the seats of consciousness, your alpha, what he asks is, he said he's not clear on, on how you become a mystic. A, a mystic is, is an evolutionary journey. You start off as, as building the body, that primate time. Then you become aware of you as separate from other things, the dawn of consciousness. You begin to think and see yourself as separate. That first stage is pagan barbarian. In that first stage, Mass man looks outside of themselves and says, well, what is this that I feel I know that is beyond me? And they see nature. And they see nature as all powerful and all destructive. So they begin to create nature gods, worshiping nature and their multiple ones. You're early in your cycle. 
that knowing that you feel is that divine gravity shaft at stillness within you, you're now knowing that there's something more than this, but you don't know what that something is. So you look for it outside of yourself. And as you evolve into the genius state and you're getting more compressed, but you're centering on knowing your desires to know, you're thinking towards center, you're becoming more enlightened. You're beginning to realize that I can make things happen if I hold my desire on it. You don't know why, you just know you can. And then you pass through that stage into the illumined stage. Flash, you go to source, you know source, you come back from source as body, and now you know where you came from and you know where you're gone, even though you still don't know fully how to get there, but you can focus your desire far more strongly in that state at center of gravity and divinity. And then you move into the next state. And even these, these uh, sections I'm walking through, they, they have levels, they have degrees. There are people that are in the genius state that we would call genius in what they do. There's also people that we call high genius. Um, Tesla, Nikola Tesla. He sees it, he knows it, he makes it. It's done completely in his mind. Russell, same thing. He said many times, I manifest nothing before it's done completely in, in my mind. And that's why he can do it without residual tension. It's already done. He just, without tension, makes it appear. That's what the mystic master Christ did when he manifested the fish and the bread. He knew he didn't, he's at center, at stillness. He knew he could manifest that. He did. You know, you can do it. You might take, uh, you, you've been baking bread over, Monica's out here in the audience. You've been baking bread. You have to go to the store. You have to buy the wheat. If you decide to grind it, you have to turn it into flour. Then you have to add water and follow the recipe and mix it all together. And you have to let it rise and all that stuff because you're learning. You're manifesting, though. He simply did it with a thought. Same light, same principle. He simply knows without question that he can do it. We are working to that knowing. So we know, oh, I can get up in the morning and go shopping, I can get some stuff and I can make a loaf of bread. Yeah. When you're at that stage, which is the Christ conscious stage the Russell's referred to, call it anything you want, God conscious, source consciousness, the force, doesn't matter. When you're at that stage of knowing, you manifest things much faster because you know, it's done. You see it, it's whole before you, you know. That's what Russell did. The, the, the statue of, the, of the, the George Washington that we have out there on, on display, you can see it online, folks, for those people who aren't in the room. He did that in a little over three hours in front of a group of people at 92 years of age. Sculpted it from form. They handed him the clay. He put the clay on. They said he was cutting, putting on and cutting the clay away so fast that one guy over here could barely hand it to him fast enough. And the other guy on the floor trying to pick up the waste material so he wouldn't step in it could barely keep up with him. Two young men, and he's up there enjoying peace, manifesting what he already finished in his mind. That's the difference. That's the best way I can explain it. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes, other cubes, other boundaries. It's eternal. Wherever a thought is uh, or a desire is, is, is manifesting, you begin, the, the reflective process begins. As it begins to line up, it's radiating light outward. It's no longer radiating light outward, you know, completely straight. So it hits the, and, and, and it's reflected inward at an angle now. And the more dense it becomes, the, the more it speeds up and the more dense that it coil becomes going in the faster it happens and the, and, and the more bent is the, is the reflection until it is bent to create two halves, perfect half spheres, one that we can register and see, the other one that we can't, but it's there. And those two halves come together, creating the whole perfect body, God. The sphere 
is the perfect reflection of divinity. The cube is the point of divinity from which it is reflected. That's it. Breathe in, breathe out. Thank you, everybody. This has been fun. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, guys. Thank you out there. And that is why I say that this course of lectures is to give everyone the knowledge of God's creative processes, the means he employs, the balance which he demands, the separateness of father-motherhood into fathers and mothers, which must interchange in balance in order to unite and as one, and that applies to every corpuscle of the body as well as it applies to every individual entity as a well. whole.